chapter 3, verses 20 to 23 to 29. And that is found on page 189 in the New Testament portion of your Bible. Now before faith came, we were in prison and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ and clothe yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And from the Gospel of Luke, Chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, found on in the New Testament section, page 68. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And as he stepped out on the land, a man of the city who had demons in him met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard, guard, and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding. And the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swamp. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people in the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged him that he might be with them. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. May God grant us understanding of these scriptures.
Matthew 9.22, Luke 8.48, which we read this morning, or would have, and Mark 9.24. All justified by faith. So I'm going to read it through for you once, and then I'm going to take it apart. This is kind of my letter to you as a congregation. Justified by faith. What does that really mean? Are all sins simply forgiven? Must evidence of faith be seen? Or is our faith a convenience to pull out when times get tough, forgotten soon thereafter, until once more the going gets rough? And is a desperate, fervent prayer enough to please God's ear when all is bleak and hope is waning and God stands by in tears? A woman reached for Jesus' cloak. His healing power was drained. Your faith has made you well, he said. Your life, she had regained. But sight unseen, what is true faith? Belief with certainty? He said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Please God, do the same for me. But what laws and policies can they not justify? Without a conscience, conscious belief of faith, machines invariably comply with rules and regulations. Without a sentient hope, as spiritual beings, God beckons us more than blind obedience for. God challenges us as servants in our desire to do God's will. Love and freedom fuel our hunger to please, to choose the true faith. God in This was written in 1999. Justified by faith. What does that mean? What does it mean? Can you have a Are our sins completely forgiven? How much evidence of faith be seen? Think about it. What does Jesus ask us to do? What does God ask us to do? God asks us to repent. Literally to turn away from it. Think about it. If we repent, who do we repent to? And what makes us repent? What makes us feel guilty? What makes you feel guilty? our own value system is one of the reasons we feel guilty. And as Christians, our value system has been taught in the words of scriptures, in the traditions of our denominations, in conversation. So that realistically, if we repent, then it is a sign that we have faith. Must evidence of faith be seen? If we repent, who do we repent to? That implies faith. Has anybody seen the picture of Jesus in the garden at um, a beautiful um, arched door similar to this window? Has anybody seen that? What's odd about that picture? Do you remember? It had a gate. Door. It had a gate and a door. But it did not have a door handle. We have to open that door. We have to turn 
away from what we're doing and toward Jesus. That is an evidence of our faith. It may be small, it may be minuscule, as opposed to what you think you should have. It may be dragunda. We have to turn to Jesus. We have to ask Jesus into our lives. When we repent, we are doing that very thing. If you have no relationships with someone, you say, well, I'm sorry. And really mean it. I mean, if you bump into a stranger in the mall or something, you probably will say, excuse me, or I'm sorry. And in that moment, there is a minor relationship. You don't say, I'm sorry, to the wall. Although sometimes I must admit I do. Too much. <laughs> is our faith a convenience? pull out when times get rough. When has your faith been a convenience? Going up only when faced with crisis. Pulled back when the crisis is waning. How many have known Jesus when they're in crisis? You reach out, don't you? you reach out with the same intensity in your daily routine? No. You can't imagine. Does anybody here reach out with exactly that same intensity? We can forget. And yet God is there within us. And God, and for instance, the other day, I was driving in the car, and I don't even remember the circumstances, so at this point I'm making it up. And Somebody stopped short in front of me. I had enough room, I put on my brake. There was no accident. Did I say to myself, or would you have said to yourself, boy, that was close. Good thing I, had, I paid attention. Or do you say, thank you, God, for nudging me to look up? Thank you, God, for keeping me attentive. That's our strength. That's our faith. <laughs> the woman reaches for Jesus' coat. Just to touch. When we reach out with prayer, when we do our intercessions in the morning, when we pray during our day, that is our evidence of our faith. Putting our good thoughts, our good wishes, our, our concerns, our joys out to the cosmos, out to God. That is what we are called to do as children of God. It doesn't matter what color we are. It doesn't matter how old or how young we are. It doesn't matter how articulate we are. Sometimes it's just hell. We reach out to God. And why do we reach out to God? Because God has first reached out to us. God is standing outside that archway, that door with no handle, waiting for us to repent, to Bring up conversation to ask the questions that are bothering us. Don't just take everything you're given. God is giving you minds. God is giving you experiences. Begin to question. Let's talk about it. Let's open up the conversation. Can you have a relationship with another human being? If you don't talk, if you don't question, well, did you really need to hurt me like that? Did you really, really need to say that in such a way that it was so brusque? Did you really need to hit me? Or did you just bump? 
God is waiting for us. God stands waiting by us. Waiting for our prayers. Waiting for our faith to show itself. What is true faith? The poem says, but sight unseen, what is true faith? Belief and certainty? I don't know about you, but I didn't spring up having all this faith. I didn't come, come well, I'm not complete yet, but <laughs> I haven't come with the wisdom that I have now at an early age. I didn't even go to church as a child unless somebody took me, because my family didn't go to church. So I remember very specifically saying, I see all these people, but I don't get it. I really don't get it. And I knew there was something missing. And this line touched me so deeply. I believe help my unbelief. When you don't know what to pray, use that prayer. Galatians speaks to faith as our justification over laws. That until Jesus came, we had this book of laws. I mean, they're incredibly pure, pure in love with the Jews. And Jesus says, you don't have to do that. You have to love God. And you have to love one another as yourselves. We are not tied to the law anymore. But there is a piece of that that's really important. If we're not tied to the law, then what makes us do right? If we can do whatever we want, drink whatever we want, party however we want, sleep with anyone we want, um, hurt anybody we want, act dismissively to other people, um, not be the poor, not try to help other people. If we can do all that and still be forgiven, because of course we know Jesus died so that we would be forgiven. What does that mean? What does that mean? I, um, I play a hidden object game on my iPad, and I tried to bring it in today, but I could. It, it, I can't get a good reception. Um, but in that hidden object game, one of the things you have to do is you have to work within a community in order to progress. People give you gifts, you give them gifts. And the end of getting to know people is kind of a microcosm of real life. You say please, you say thank you. Uh, some people are downright rude, you get rid of them. Off your friend list. Um, you see who's invested. I've come to know people. I mean, I've, it, it's opened my world. I had a friend from Syria who talked about the bombings. I could pray for Syria in a different way. I have a friend from Indonesia, all over the world. And this game helps um, bridge those cultural gaps. But I have this one friend who, she, she just makes me laugh every day. And her, she sent a quote every day. And most of the times they are fairly irreverent, uh, sometimes pretty sarcastic. Sometimes pretty funny, and she just tickles my heart so that very frequently I am laughing out loud when she writes her remarks. This is this morning's remark. Now, remember, there's this serendipity to the Holy Spirit. This is my topic, justified by faith. The question I just asked is that does that faith? a carte blanche permission for us to do whatever we want. This was her quote. She's from California, I know that. She's a nurse, I know that. I have no idea what the actual name is. 
She said, I asked God for a bike, but I know God doesn't work that way. So I stole a bike and asked for forgiveness. And it says, I haven't really saw the bed too long. How many times do we do that? Kind of had the expenses. Um, may not be stealing a bike. But it was perfect. It was perfect for this one. So I stole the bike and asked for forgiveness. How many times do we do things or say things that without Jesus was standing there, we would never are. We would never do. And yes, we are justified by faith. God challenges us as servants in our desire to do God's will. Love and freedom fuel our hunger pleas to choose the true faith God instills. Can you just do what you want, assuming forgiveness? Or are you held to a higher standard? Does your relationship with God kind of challenge you to be a better person? There is a, um, I mean, I was in bed last night, and I had to get out my concordance and find this passage. It's from Luke. Verses 12-48. From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be given. We have been given a sacred gift. Jesus died for us. For you, for you, and for you and for me, and for you. So that we could live free from the law. What do you hope from your children as they grow? You hope to give them values. You hope to show them the way. You hope to give them guidance. Jesus was the person who taught us the way us those values. Spin the world around in his time. And what do you pray and hope for your children as they are grown? You pray and hope that they choose to make wise decisions. You pray and hope they do good because good is the right thing to do. You pray and hope they have compassion. You pray and hope that they aren't deceitful liars. You pray and hope that you don't see them on the news because they've been jailed. You pray and you hope everything. And that's what God does for us. And then God lets us make our choices. The question for you is, what are you going to choose? 